Pole search. Okay. So, um, anyway, I've been coming back, uh, you know, I've been back to, into Georgia many, many times over the years. Uh, this is the first time I've been able to come out to this uh, uh, fine part of uh, Georgia and to be in this funny place that I would get these funny catalogs called Peachtree Woodworking. Um, and, um, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I uh, grew up in, uh, I was born on the West Coast, uh, grew up there until the uh, fine young age of about uh, 15 years old, uh, and then my parents uh, figured that I would be much better served by going over to Europe instead of continuing my schooling in California. Um, so I moved over to Switzerland when I was about 15, and I did a variety of uh, three different apprenticeships over there. And one of the fortunate things that I found uh, at the time that I could actually be, uh, that I was actually able to train with some of the finest craftsmen in the world. Uh, I had no idea about that at the time. You know, I just wanted to be back in California with my friends doing what people in California do, whatever that was. And uh, they were very wise in their fore, uh, in their looking ahead, and they said um, that uh, that would be a much better application of my youth, uh, to be involved with an apprenticeship versus, uh, you know, <coughs> race, racing around in cars. So uh, after my apprenticeship, I came back to California uh, and uh, started a business there. And uh, over the years have developed a, uh, a very, uh, a successful furniture making business and this idea of doing marquetry with it only came maybe about 20 years ago. Uh, as we all know furniture makers are not some of the high, you know, highest paid tradition of craftsmen or highest paid people that there are. I found that making it as a woodworker was a little tough but with the addition with, of marquetry to embellish a project uh, it seemed to make things very viable. And um, <clears throat> I've been now teaching for about uh, 15 years. Uh, I've done probably, I don't know how many classes, but we figured that I've probably um, had the pleasure of working for a little over 2,000 people. And um, that tradition does now continue. And I have many students of mine now that compete with me on shows and I have learned that I probably don't like to compete that much anymore. You know, I have uh, certain people, uh, you know, that you might, uh, names that you might recognize that have come through my shop to learn marquetry. Um, uh, Craig Thibodeau, Ron Myland, um, Greg Zoll. There's a number of people that have gone off and made businesses or careers of doing marquetry. So uh, I'm going to show you uh, 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 some slides of not only marquetry, but furniture making, how I was trained to do furniture making and, and what goes into it. Uh, the marquetry uh, will also be covered and also some other unusual aspects of doing veneering or working in different ways with, with veneer, with shapes, with design that are maybe be a little bit, a little innovative. So without further ado, if I could have the lights, I'd like to start with um, some, some of the things that we have uh, done here. So marquetry uh, is really a, um, uh, started for me back in Switzerland uh, in a, a small place called Neuchâtel, a uh, French speaking part of Switzerland making church organs. This was one instrument that uh, we made <coughs> out of many. It was a small business, maybe 14, 15 people, but what 
Um, this was actually my sec second apprenticeship. The first one was building pianos, and I graduated then and started to build church organs. One thing I knew about church organs is they had their hand in every trade that there is. They did leather making, uh, welding, woodworking, m you know, uh, soldering, uh, worked with leather, plastics, intonation, history, music. It had a very, very well-rounded um, shop that would have 12 different trades within the shop. For me, it was a big playground, always building stuff when I was a kid. Uh, it was great. I could just do any kind of crazy project that I could think up. From there, um, there was a, uh, when I came back to California, um, I did, started with reproduction work. And, you know, I've, I've shortened this slideshow down so we can get out of here, and, you know, within a couple of hours, but uh, the three apprenticeships which I did was piano making <clears throat> as a piano builder, church organ building, and then boat building. As a boat builder, um, the reason I did boat building was I was really lacking in, in curves. I mean, we're really used to table saw cutting straight lines. Uh, there is, uh, we think in boxes a lot as a cabinet makers. and. There was a, I, I felt that there was something lacking, you know, curves, making wood, uh, making woodwork in hostile environments such as water. Uh, boat building seemed to really satisfy that urge to create things that were really different. And I use those techniques now every day. Uh, the combination of uh, musical instruments and boat building really gave me the basics and the skills that I needed to continue. Back in California, reproduction work was really uh, the way that I got started. And there was always a, a demand for doing things that were, uh, you know, other styles. So it really gave me a, an opportunity to study various styles of furniture that came from uh, different places around the world and build uh, some things that were uh, fairly unusual. Uh, for example, this cabinet here was a, of a, uh, a very large kind of a Napoleon um, type Regency cabinet which would house a TV. In other words, you, you push a button and uh, the whole top slides back and the TV pops out of the top. You know, so these are some of the mechanical systems that I was doing in Switzerland that really helped me develop pieces of furniture uh, or reproduction furniture that would do modern things. Uh, from there, I had got my first taste with marquetry by having a decorator that said, well, you know, you're trained in Europe, so of course you know about marquetry. I didn't know the first thing about it because up in Switzerland, we really didn't do marquetry. I said, well, of course, I can do that. And I, uh, you know, went home and I go to the library and what I found was that in marquetry that every book contradicted, everybody contradicted e each other. Some people said, oh, you have to use sawn veneer. Some people said, glue it down with contact cement. Other people said, oh, you, you know, you can only uh, do it in all these certain ways. And I, I really found no information that agreed. So I decided to do this table uh, with inlay. Now the decorator, being who he was, decided that he wanted an unusual piece. So in this piece, I had actually also some stonework. This is lapis lazuli, uh, which is a very, very hard stone. And I had over 75 pieces of lapis lazuli in this table. So not only was I doing intarsia or intarsia, but I was also doing stone inlay. That I realized after six months that I was in deep trouble. I had estimated a fixed price on it, like I do all pieces. And after you start putting those kind of hour, hours into it, and your wage starts dropping from $15 to $5 an hour to $3 an hour, I realized when it dropped below $4 an hour that I was very, uh, really in deep trouble. <clears throat> I decided that there had to be a better way to do this. I decided that there was, um, um, you know, there was certainly some skills and some um, uh, some people over in Europe that did this kind of work. So I went on a various searches uh, throughout Germany, uh, England, and Italy to find other craftsmen that did this kind of work. And I ended up in this shop called uh, Ramonti and Tarsi Tori. And that was a little north of Milano. 
and furniture making capital of, uh, of Europe. And in there I found a gentleman that was, had taught many people and I was this first American that came in and he asked me, well, why do you want to come here? And I said, well, here's a sample of this table that I did and I showed him a sample of the inlay that I did and, and the picture that you just saw on the last panel and he said, you know, did, you did this? And I go, yes, I did. And he started laughing uncontrollably, just laugh, just, and, and until tears were streaming down his face, and he would call the foreman over and they looked and they're both laughing. I didn't know what to make of this. And he said, look, um, how much, how long are you here for? And I said, well, I'm, I have to fly home next week. And he goes, a week. Uh, that's enough time, okay. Uh, and he went over to a bench and he cleared it away and he says, okay, now this is a veneer, okay. This is a scroll saw. This is the packet cutting technique and this is how you do it. So started my education. I realized that there was a much easier way to do images, marquetry, and doing furniture decoration than I had, could imagine. You know, previously I would do it all inlay. Now I had a way of being able to do it quickly, rapidly, easily, and I had a tremendous amount of creative freedom. So they did a lot of reproduction work as well, uh, so that is still a big part of their business. But I realized soon that um, when I was there, I would go back every year for maybe three weeks to a month every year with my work in a, in a, uh, uh, like a, a portfolio and then build my veneer skins there, bring them back to California and glue them up. I had, was developing a, a bit of a following, a client base that supported that habit of going over. And the one thing that he did tell me um, before he passed away, he says, I've, I've taught you everything now. I'm you know, really, I'm teaching you all these techniques and it's really my duty to really pass those techniques on. So he's a very generous man. Um, and just to give you an idea here, this is a, uh, uh, I went back to Sorrento uh, in 2009. I, I like this part here, this, this man, as you can see, he's working on a scroll saw, on an old style scroll saw. Look at how close that arm is to his head. Now he's been doing this probably his whole life. Uh, and, and you know, I can see a little, little you know, just, just grazing and that's sort of his control. That's where he knows where it is. And the entire time I was in this shop, he only said maybe four words. So his wife, uh, which would be assembling the marquetry, was nonstop. She was just chattering away and, and he was just like he was doing his marquetry and you know we would uh, I had this ongoing conversation with her but this is some of the shop and this is like a typical shop that you would see with a pile of marquetry. It's summer I can tell because of the pile of chips of, of leftover marquetry the stuff that you don't use. Uh, however during winter that goes to fuel the heat where they have you know they have a little stove in the back that they would burn all that scrap. So it is a, um, it's still a tradition in Sorrento to do this kind of thing, but you can see some of the, the skin, some of the marquetry uh, that they produce is really quite, impre uh, quite incredible. If anybody's been to Sorrento, they can see uh, these shops that just have these mountains of furniture. Uh, Lazy Susans, there's, I mean, this is just some of the work that they do. And what I learned was this type of work is, this um, system that they use is a production style technique. Uh, you can make multiple copies of it. Uh, it's not a double bevel technique or knifing technique. So, um, so started my um, education into marquetry and just to show you some of the diversity that it is. Coming back to California, um, I decided that I needed to start doing marquetry, start doing inlay, and uh, fulfill the obligations of my teacher, which is to continue teaching the trade. I developed a line of tools that was the basics necessary for decorative veneering and marquetry. And with the, uh, with the addition of a vacuum press, it became very easy to press up work uh, consistently and, and pretty well. So this is like a small starter vacuum pump system that uh, which allows you to clamp um, curved shapes, flat shapes, but have even pressure throughout. Uh, as we know, trying to clamp veneer with just a few clamps, a few blocks, you have to be kind of careful, you have to do it properly with 
but with a vacuum press, it makes it quite easy. Uh, there are certain techniques that we use that, you know, that were, were part of decorative veneering, for example, cutting veneer with an inch and a half chisel. Using the chisel and using veneer as a fence to, uh, to inlay things. There's a veneer saw, which is used to cut veneer into shapes or patterns, and we still use this um, today. And these basic tools have not changed for, you know, 100 years. They're all basically the same kind of tool, maybe modernized a little bit. For example, instead of a scalpel, people could use an X-Acto knife or uh, a layout knife. I use a scalpel because they're very hard, uh, it's a high carbon steel, it's easy to sharpen, and um, they're readily available. So the chisel is used for cutting, using it for paring, where you can do you know, perfect miters. And one thing that I really like uh, is blue tape. And those people that have taken the class know this. If they had blue tape, tape you know, 200 years ago, I guarantee you they would have been using it. Yeah. So a lot of these techniques have been handed down for centuries, virtually centuries. Uh, but basically, the technique is this, and I'm going to explain marquetry or this style of marquetry in the next four photos. This is what's called the packet cutting technique, where I can take veneer. This is a cartoon. These are all the various pieces of veneer, and this is my background. And what I do is I put this packet together with all the gum tape on it. Gum tape is a very fine paper tape that has a water-activated adhesive on it, usually hide glue. And this keeps the veneer together through the cutting process, through the sand shading, through the uh, entire manufacturing process of this panel, which will come off after the panel is glued down. Uh, you can loosen it up with with water and it'll peel off, you sand it off, but it is an integral part of this technique and makes it possible to do extraordinary detail. After the packet is put together, uh, you have many layers of veneer here and these patterns are cut out on a scroll saw. Uh, and I find that any scroll saw will work as long as it will hold a 2 ot blade or a 2 slash 0 blade. Uh, this is my scroll saw at home, or one of them, which has a spring top I'm not using the spring top much anymore because uh, as when the blade breaks, it makes a sound like a 12-gauge shotgun going off in your face. Uh, the scroll saws that we had here, the DeWalt is a perfectly acceptable machine to be able to do it. At this point in time, there's about, four, uh, about I would say, 25 different scroll saws which are on the market. All of them work really quite well for doing this, uh, this kind of work. Um, here's all the pieces put out. So the pattern and the background were in here with all the little pieces. We make little stacks, we sand shade them, which is burning the veneer to give it depth and give it the illusion of depth. So when we can put it all together, and you can kind of see here, there it is, it's all together. This is the glue surface without the gum tape. This is the surface that actually gets glued onto my substrate. Afterwards, that gum tape, which is on the other side, that comes off after it's glued down, that's scraped off, that's sanded off, and you have your pattern. You have your finished panel. So that's basically the technique which I have, which is called a packet or stack cutting method. Um, in marquetry, there's actually six basic techniques, and I find this one is the easiest, the most versatile. Um, I know that like Mark Adams or Silas Kopf, people use a double bevel technique which I'm still struggling to try to understand how that actually is an asset or actually how does that work. I still don't get it. So with that, coming back to America, and these are the kind of jobs that I would get. This is again focusing on marquetry. This was a, a cabinet, an, an old cabinet that was actually missing one door. Now tell me how that happens. <laughs> one door was gone. Hmm. So I had to actually remanufacture a door. It was actually pretty easy because when you think about it, I was able to make a pattern of this, uh, just showing you the pattern of the, uh, this, is putting a piece of uh, clear plastic down, making a cartoon with a Sharpie, and then able to 
construct and make a panel that would look identical to the other side. So this looks very complicated for most people, but when you take marquetry or furniture of this nature and break it down to its components, it's actually relatively straightforward. So as we can see that this is a duplicate of these two sides, it's actually a mirror image, and it, it worked pretty well. So a lot of this type of work was uh, uh, given to me in the beginning. So starting to build my own furniture, I went, well, I, I have this great clientele that really enjoys reproduction, so I decided to make kind of reproductions of my own. This is not a true reproduction, but it is something that could be a reproduction. It looks old. I designed this little uh, brass feet, I, uh, did all the casting for it, or sent it down to a bronze caster. Uh, a curved column, this is a tilt-top table, and it was... Um, in drawing it, it's, I call it the Charles X uh, table, and uh, made 10 of them, and they sold quite well. And this gave me the idea that I could actually do this for a living. A table like this, uh, we're regularly selling, it started out selling for about $6,000, and by the time that the 10th one, they were up to a, about double that. That would be retail. So uh, these are like two of the, of the same uh, the same piece. This is actually the eleventh one, the artist proof. I made ten of these out of purple heart and uh, organ laurel. Uh, this one was actually an ecologically built table. In other words, it was entered into a competition saying, can you use all sustainable woods, sustainable glues, or non-toxic glues, non-toxic finishes. So at the time, 15 years ago, somebody came up with a, uh, an orange, uh, a finish made with, from orange peels. And I went, well, this sounds kind of interesting. I used it. I still have that table, and the finish is still quite good. Uh, and it was used by my mother for at least 10 years. And uh, when she passed away, I got it back. And she was not always taking the best of care on her furniture, but it aged quite well. Quite happy with it. So this led to other projects. Um, you know, doing expand, uh, uh, expanding tables, one that would expand from 7 feet to 14 feet. A uh, lot of inlay, starting to use mother of pearl, ebony, developing, you know, furniture that was, uh, you were able to knock it down, be able to take it apart, uh, be able to maintain it. Because that's one of the things I found out in restoration of furniture, that a lot of pieces couldn't be re restored or repaired. They didn't think that far ahead. Uh, you know, what happens if veneer starts lifting off or it takes a tumble down the stairs? You need to be able to fix it. So a lot of the furniture I designed at this point was, I was able to take it apart, to be able to fix it, to be able to repair it. Not just me, but the next guy. So this was a very important part of my development as a furniture de designer, that everything is KD or knocked down as much as possible, screwed together. Mortise and tenants, yes, but then fast, make it in, uh, fasten it with a peg or screws or concealed plugs or some way that I can actually take it apart. That actually adds quite a bit of effort to the design process and to the manufacturing process, which a client doesn't always see. So these pieces always took me a lot longer than you know, my competitor, but I could stand behind the fact that it could be repaired. And there has been many times in the past, actually, that furniture has come back to be repaired, or I've given instructions to a cabinet maker how to take it apart, how to repair it, and how to put it back together without the piece having to come back to Santa Barbara. At this point, furniture uh, in the 80s was going, uh, I was highly, being quite productive. Uh, this furniture was going all over the world. I uh, have pieces you know, in Russia, in Ireland, South America. So they've been kind of disappearing in different corners of the planet. And um, I then started to ramp up. I had about four employees, four to six employees, uh, that had been trained in my shop and were working on doing limited edition pieces. This one was uh, uh, Rosie. I call this one Rosie with a captured ring. Again, it's not really a duplicate of anything that I saw. It was just a design that I felt was very pleasing. Um, 
with the design of any table, um, you know, comes the development of what we call the cartoon. The cartoon is a drawing of what you want to make in marquetry. This is a rough layout. And as you can kind of see here, I first started by just going a rough layout and sort of basic, where is the flower is going to be? And this is sort of the next stage of the process, developing, developing, developing until right over here you can see everything has a number. And now we can see all the, this is a finished cartoon. 880 pieces, um, 27 roses because that was every letter of the alphabet. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, I had to work this design quite a bit because as I was starting to formulate the roses and understand how they're put together, by the time I get back to here, it was time to redraw. And on the third round, I think I got it. Uh, making the cartoon took more time than building the, the entire production line. Drawings are everything, but this was disproportionate in the drafting time. Uh, it was quite a bit of effort to actually generate this cartoon. So I said, you know, I'm going to make 12 of these roses. Instead of calling a bouquet of flowers, I decided to call this one basta fiori, which means no more flowers. <laughs> I'm done with them. Um, and, you know, from a cartoon like this, this is a flower cue. You can see here that this is actually how it's rendered in marquetry. As you can see, the sand shading is done in areas, uh, and there's a fairly simple rule that you can use where anything is behind gets sand shaded that edge, or anything that's underneath gets sand shaded. But the sand shading really adds that realism and depth that I'm looking for. Also, another thing which is great about this technique is the saw cuts here. These saw cuts are actually done with the small saw, and they are design elements. Now, I do know in Jane Burke, Burke's work or in double bevel technique that the goal is to have absolutely no gaps, to have everything completely tight fitting. That's great for some people, but I'm using that saw kerf as a design element because as I glue it up, the glue squeezes up through. It becomes part of the design. It's also easier to fit things in. It's also faster. Also, I have complete control of my creativity. Also, I can make multiples. Yes, sir? Do you color your glues? Occasionally I do, but generally I'm going with a dark glue. That's, that's the basic premise, that it's going to be a dark glue. If I have a very light background, yeah, I'll use a lighter glue. But on a dark background, these lines are generally dark. Oh, on the, on the leaves on the bottom? Yes. Where you, they, they go from green to red. Is, there a, is that just two pieces of veneer? Yeah, these are two different pieces. You mean this one? Yeah, two different, two different colors of veneer. Let's talk about the edge where it looks like it's shaded. Oh, this one? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's actually shaded inside that leaf. So that's what we were doing in class is we were dipping one side and dipping the other so it gives you that illusion of a fold. And leaf backs are uh, generally a lighter colored veneer. So that sand shading here, uh, as you see here, that gives you a, a real kind of a three-dimensional effect. It, it almost looks like there's red in there. Is that, is that come as a result of the sand shading? That may be on this green veneer. It has this reddish cast uh, when, it's, uh, when it's shaded. Uh, this is tulipier, which is a natural color. Th these are all natural colors. So they're, they are not you know, manufactured uh, uh, or, or dyed. So they are, they're, Those green leaves are, are tulipier? Uh, tulipier, yes. Yeah, now they are green. Now, I think that they come a dark green. Some of them, like the ones that we have in class, have been stabilized, so the green doesn't fade with time, unlike poplar. But they are uh, a variety of different greens. This is holly, that's elm, and the background was ebony. So a design starts with a concept. You know, here I wanted to make a game table. I figured that there was a uh, market for it, so I drew a variety of designs. Whether I do it for a client or for myself, everything really starts with a rough sketch. It gets developed into a real drawing, and this is actually a, what I call a mechanical drawing of the piece. Here the, the legs, they can, uh, they can unscrew, uh, the caps can come off, these two caseworks here, this all comes apart. Everything, again, is knocked down. 
The chairs are not. The chairs, I find that they are knocked down. I did not want to take the chance of fasteners weakening or loosening with age, so they are completely glued together. The seat, of course, does come off for reupholstery, uh, but the, uh, this table does. This table does break down. And um, you can kind of see these, uh, uh, at the top flips back, you have backgammon, you have chess, and you have this uh, game here. What, what is this game? Tic-tac-toe. Tic-tac-toe. What's nice about this tic-tac-toe, it's kind of flattened, has a great image on it, and if you know the rules of tic-tac-toe, if you play it properly, it's always a draw. It's always a draw. Nobody wins. But on this one, sometimes you can beat people over and over and over because it's confusing. It's an illusion. It's do not look at this hand. Don't look at it. I'll tell you, don't look at it. See, it, it, this is all very distracting. You know, all the flowers, it's kind of a collapsed image. And uh, there are certain people that have trouble kind of figuring out the game because they're so trapped by the image. So it's also a game within a game, tic-tac-toe. And no, I did not make the chess parts. I, I, I don't want to do that. So jewelry boxes, uh, I was going to go from a rough sketch to make this jewelry box here. And what goes into the jewelry box is actually quite a bit of work here. Uh, this has, you know, a captured wood technique. This is solid wood here. There's false panels in it. There's gold-plated hinges. The prob I think one of my problems is that I don't, kind of don't know where to stop with the quality uh, and with the uh, depth of it. Uh, I was planning to do a hundred of these boxes, and after the third one, I figured that that was probably about it. That's about all I was good for. Same frame, different personalities. This is a gun case, jewelry box, and a cigar box. So from there, I said, well, you know, let me do a limited edition of what I call the budget box. And the budget box would be a solid frame and then leftover marquetry panels. Uh, when we do this kind of packet cutting technique, we generate multiple copies just because of you know, I have st up to 16 layers of veneer, which I cut out. So if I have 16 layers of veneer in this cartoon, full size, I actually can generate a complete 16 copies, each one with different veneers. One may have the black background with the white rose. That you give to your wife or your sweetheart. The black rose on the white background goes to your mother-in-law. <laughs> so there's something for everybody, you know, like in Christmas, it's great. You know, you have a red flower, Dad, how did you do all this, you know? Or, you know, how did you make all these patterns, they look identical but using different woods? And, and you say, oh, the jigs, the templates, you know, it's so... <laughs> you know, that's what you tell clients. So uh, it is really the leftover marquetry that we would have hanging out in the shop. We could, we could actually utilize these for the, these cabinets and you know put things together in very rapid order so generating the cartoon or pattern I like doing line drawings um, I figured that this was a sort of a new style or technique of being able to do what we call in the artist world interrupts or there are elements which go outside of the borders sort of fits my personality type and I thought that I was the first one to to come up with it until I went to the High Art Museum here in Georgia, where I saw the Herder brothers, and they've been doing this since the late 1800s. So, as I figured, I have always something to learn. So, um, many of the cartoons are um, have been uh, uh, used uh, over and over. Um, I've been able to uh, make. Uh, the budget box, or this is a jewelry box, this is for a two-day class where people start with relatively no prior experience. They make a jewelry box and they put a decorative veneer top on it. So these are uh, a variety of classes of what I've been uh, doing in the past for those people that want a little box. Great right around, you know, February, February 15th, you know, a little bit before that. It's a good time to do that. Um, also, the design can be a little uh, interesting that I find that I always learn things by drawing and then put making a cartoon. This is of a, of a table and that's the actual top here. 
So the mechanical drawing is actually underneath on the piece of paper and I have the drawing of the cartoon on top. The ability again for production line working, I'm able to make five copies all at once. But I didn't like this table. You know, something's wrong with it. Didn't know what it was. But when you look at it, can anybody tell me what's, what's missing from this design? What, what's not working here? Like the base. The base. What's, what's up with it? It's too heavy. It's too heavy. Yeah, it is. So how do I change each of the other copies? How do I thin that base down or make it different? Well, I kind of experimented and with this I started putting pieces of cardboard and on it and kind of seeing, well, it was actually in the making a, of a drawer underneath. And if I look at that table, that has more balance. That's more weighted. That has that feeling of, uh, of, uh, of, of balance, which I'm looking for. So sometimes you have to play around, and sometimes not every project is going to be a home run. You know, there's something that a Turner said to me. He says, if, you're, if you hit the target every time, you're standing too close to it. Or if, you don't, if you're not on the edge and taking those big risks, move over because you're taking up too much room. You know, so I find that it's a, always an evolving process. I always have something to learn about design or about my work and be willing to accept that maybe it wasn't the best design choice and be willing to change. So this one was a full uh, you know, extension drawer, which was pretty tough to do, but you know, we managed to get through. From a rough sketch, we developed drawings, you know, this is um, all this big ribbon. And uh, you'll see here on this ribbon, I did the entire marquetry panel, fairly simple. And then I took that panel, glued it up, and then cut it apart for the drawers. So here's a part of the foot. And this is just a detail. Levelers on the foot. Here's the panel inside. Again, I try to draw everything out. Try to figure out all the problems at this stage, because I'm going to have enough of them in the shop. By drawing everything out, even to the last screw, I've already built this whole piece in my mind. Anybody that's tried to build a house without the benefit of blueprints knows this. Okay, cement truck is coming today. Let's just start pouring cement. Right. No, that doesn't work that way. You really want to have a plan, uh, something that will give you as few changes as possible as you uh, develop the project. So here's one, this is like a very uh, effective image where it goes, uh, appears to wrap down here under the table and pop back up on the top of the table. And yes, underneath that lip, I did inlay a little piece of ribbon because I know you guys are probably gonna look under there. You know, <laughs> I, I know that. So I really had no choice. Uh, so I had to really go to some extraordinary lengths to make this work. Um, at the top, we don't really have a clear picture of the top, but that's the only 48 point radial mesh that I've done in the past and the only one that I'll ever do. A uh, 48 point a radial mesh is a nightmare beyond belief, especially with Swiss pear, which is so, you know, the humidity drops 5% and, you know, the, the, the whole thing shrinks and it, nothing matches anymore. So it was just a. Uh, a nightmare of a radial match. I thought it would be, you know, kind of cool to challenge myself, but eh, I've been there, done that. I'm not interested in doing it anymore. Here, I always have done this, and kind of wrap it around the bowling pin here. So um, what I find effective here is that really looks three-dimensional by not only sand shading the ribbon, but also the filetti. See, that? it really does appear that that's wrapping around. It's also quite humorous to see people going up to the ribbon and they're trying to pick it up. So, uh, ribbon work, I did quite a bit of ribbon work. Uh, this is a very kind of a stylized ribbon with a, um, you know, a drop leaf. Um, again, I, I really do try to draw out as much as possible because I do know that there will be changes that will happen. Uh, this ribbon is, is, is an example of just trying to draw it out so it works. And as you can kind of see, this is a close up of it that um, dark wood in the back, light wood in the front, and this filetti that goes all the way through. It was fairly successful, uh, a great design. <laughs>